Hi, everybody. Thank you all for joining us. Today is going to be probably my most important interview that I'm going to post on my channel, and you're going to find out why just in a second. With me, I have Mike Collins, the founder of SugarAddiction.com and the sugar-free man who has been sugar-free for how many years now? 33. Amazing. You have raised also sugar-free babies from the womb, no sugar up until they were six years of age. And then after yeah. that, it was what, just once a month, maybe? You never at home, just always yeah. know, outside and birthday parties. Fantastic. You get it. You understand food addiction. You understand sugar addiction. And I should say we have an update. You have recently... <laughs> <laughs> converted to a carnivore diet. I'm so excited about that. I'm going to ask you a little bit more about that too. But first, can you share a little bit with our audience, um, just a little background and uh, what eventually led you to understand the, the sugar addiction and what you're doing now with it, with the uh, with the website and the program, the sobriety meetings, all that stuff. Yeah, it's a. Uh... I got a podcast version. It's uh, probably, like I said, it brings up more questions than it answers, but it, it really did start a generation ago uh, with my mom, who uh, was my favorite sugar junkie, honestly. she uh, Her mother died when she was just eight years old. And, and when you look at it, they had to move in, my grandfather and her had to move in with his sister. They had a big, they owned like this four corners and they owned the convenience store across the way. It was basically a general store then. And my grandfather made a deal with his cousin, Jim, that anytime my mom walked into that store, she could have anything she wanted and just put it on his tab. Well, a wonderful thing to do for an eight-year-old girl who just lost her mother, it really cemented into my mother that sugar was love. And that literally is how I grew up. I mean, she didn't know the difference. Like it, to her, giving us sugar was love and helping us, you know, help, helping love us really kind of wild. But, and so I was just covered up with sugar. I mean, it was just insane how the amount of sugar that we had full unfettered access to the sugar bowl. I mean, no, they didn't even like, didn't say a word, never a word in our whole life. I have that sugar bowl from the estate. It's like, just put as much on your cornflakes and sugar, you know, you could scrape off like a half an inch with the milk at the, at the end and Kool-Aid with like three times the recipe. Uh, we could just make it right. We had, we used to eat bread and butter and sugar sandwiches, like when there was not any food around. So, you know, fast forward, I, 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 I ran into beer now, I didn't realize the sugar was changing how I felt. I didn't realize it. I just liked it. I mean, the science now knows that it was changing how I felt, made me feel good. It was hitting my dopamine receptors. But I didn't begin to realize what substances did to me until I got to, um, you know, 13, 14, ran into beer. And I knew that changed my state. Like, I was kind of shy, and I could talk to the girls, drink the beer behind the high school, right? And, uh, and so, you know, liquid courage, we used to call it back then. Anyway, fast forward to 28, I got sober and, uh, we can talk about that. I'm kind of an open book about that. We're actually going to be doing a summit on it soon. Um, but I went right back to sugar. I got sober as do many recovering people. Like I just started ramp and I didn't really use sugar when I was drinking or doing drugs. And so I ended up um, adult acne, bleeding gums. It was a nightmare. I mean, my I, the only thing I wanted when I quit drinking <clears throat> was not to look like my grandfather with the big red nose, you know? And uh, I had the rosacea. I mean, it was really bad. And so I, um, I started to look at it and I started to read about it and ran across a book called Sugar Blues. And Sugar Blues was written by a guy named William Duffy who married Gloria Swanson, the famous movie star. And uh, they promoted that book pretty heavily in the 70s and 80s. And so I, I you know, it just hit my head. I, I just got in my head and, and I just quit the sugar slowly. It took me a year to quit sugar. First, I quit caffeine because that was giving me anxiety because I, I used to drink eight 16 ounce Mountain Dews a day. Um, wow. The, yeah, like the deposit bottles 
so that I didn't have to pay as much. And I literally, they called me the Mountain Dew man. Every morning I go get my other eight pack or whatever. Um, and it was, the anxiety was killing me. So I quit the caffeine, then the sugar, then the flour. But that took three years, like back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I was just kept like trying to quit, trying to quit. Mm. And so when I finally got off it, I ended up marrying a woman who uh, was also in recovery. And somehow at that time, I talked her into uh, when she got pregnant, like no flour, no sugar, no caffeine in the womb. Oh, and, and then it lasted till they were six, the boys were six years old. So they had a very unique uh, childhood, to say the least. They never had sugar in the home, but when they went to outside birthday parties after that, they had a little. Mm-hmm. And uh, they always said, Dad, write a book, write a book, write a book. You know, stop talking about it. We don't want to hear about it anymore. <laughs> and so I, I did. And that was 2018. And I bought Sugar Addiction like 2009 or eight or something like that. And I didn't do, I was working at the time, working regular kind of life and career and stuff. And I put out really, really good information. I mean, seriously good information, best on the, at that time. But I wasn't coaching. I didn't have groups or anything like that. It wasn't until I was kind of semi-retired that I um, started coaching online and started growing these groups. And that's when it really took off about six or seven years ago, something like that, five or six years ago. Mm-hmm. And now it's just, you know, 40,000 people in the community and it's huge Facebook groups, you know, all this kind of stuff where what we found and what I found over the years of coaching and stuff is this, this truly is a substance use disorder. This is an addiction. This is not a diet, has nothing to do with diet, exercise, nutrition, nothing. It's, it's a, it has to do with emotional wellness it has to do with, and comfort food is called comfort food for a reason. And it's a big joke and empty calories are a big joke. But now the science, and, and you know, I've been doing these summits for, it's been seven years, but we've done 10 events because we started doing them twice a year. And I've literally been uh, able to watch the science around sugar addiction, sugar in general, sugar in the body, uh, explode sugar in the brain, sugar in the emotions, uh, you know, explode in the last three to five years. And just not anyone really knows about it. these wonderful scientists have been languishing in anonymity for um, in their labs. One of my guys here in LA, he's, he's got $50 million in funding for obesity, childhood obesity. And no one ever knows, doesn't, doesn't even know about the guy. You know what I mean? What's you you find him. Michael Gorin, he finally wrote a book called Sugar Proof. Oh. Uh, it's really good. Um, got to get him on. For a- yeah, no, you, you'd enjoy Michael. And, and he has a, a co-author, Elizabeth, I think. I forget her name. But oh. um, but yeah, so, you know, the Robert Lustig's and the Chris Palmer's and, the, you know, people with the brain stuff and the Richard Johnson's on fructose. And, you know, it just goes on. And, and their research is impeccable. They're, you know, very famous. And I've been blessed to be able to see all this and put it all together. And and every day I do it, I know more and more that this is, you know, substance use disorder is the non and destigmatized term uh, for addiction. All of the government websites have been changed to substance use disorder, addiction, addict, junkie. These are not words people use anymore. And so, you know, this truly is a substance use disorder. Mm-hmm. And And folks need to understand that, that it has more to do with their emotions than their stomach or their diet or their exercise, or even the food they're eating at some level, uh, as long as they're not eating ultra processed carbs. So anyway, that's this podcast version. Uh, If uh, it usually brings up more questions than answers, but uh, yeah, yeah. that's how Uh, I got here. Before we dive into uh, just how addictive sugar is, you were able to eventually, after a six month of trying to cut off caffeine, you were able to be done with that and then flour and then sugar. Uh, I don't know if it was in that order. And then after that, you kept some grains and you kept some uh, fruits, right? And then eventually you had to cut those out too, right? Great. You're right. I missed that part of the question. So uh, or the part, part of the story is about seven years ago, I was uh, the chairman of the Food Addiction Institute and one of, one of the board members, Cynthia, um, 
started talking to me about, and Cynthia, I respected more than a lot. I shouldn't say it that way, but more than a few people over there. And uh, because she'd been sober for 50 years and sugar, flour, and grain free for 25. Mm -hmm. And so again, like the carnivore stuff, I mean, it was an experiment to me. It was like, I use my own children for a guinea pig. I'm fine with using myself as a guinea pig. You know what I mean? Right. So, uh, and at that time I had the adult acne, my gums had bled my whole life. I had these basal cells like, like diagnosed from a doctor and, you know, and, and so I quit grains, I quit fruit, I quit fruit juice, I quit dried fruit. And, and honestly, I quit vegetarianism and veganism, that kind of thing, and mm. started eating animal products. And I'm not exaggerating when I tell you my gums stopped bleeding. And I, my gums had bled since a childhood. I thought that's what gums did when you brush them, right? They stopped bleeding. Um, I haven't had a pimple in, you know, five or seven years. And so it, it the outside inflammation change. So now I'm thinking to myself, what was going on inside my body inflammation wise, right? Mm. So yeah, that was definitely an important part of the story that I left out. Good catch on that one. And and now um, you're trying to see what would happen if you take out the veggies, because uh, the last podcast you ever gave, you probably still were having vegetables because I watched all your podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm has humbled. changed? <laughs> humbled. They're no. great. Yeah, no, I, it is true. I, I, um, my new experiment is I, I used to call my diet green keto or like high green keto or something, because I would eat just greens and animal products, right? Eggs, cheese. I, I try and stay away from cheese now, but it's still a hard one. Um, and then I went right straight to beef, you know what I mean? And so I dropped the veggies and now it's like, beef salt and water kind of thing and i'm just i feel better than i felt in a long long time i tell this story like when i was in my 40s i used to work out with the biggest and the baddest gym owners and guys and they're like counts how come you can't gain any weight you're strong and they're like, like how come you don't gain any muscle like mass and here i am in my 60s and i'm like like getting ripped, not to say ripped, but, and I'm not, you know, I'm not gaining a lot of weight, but there's a lot of definition happening and just, and I'm not even working out that hard. It's okay. been amazing. It's just been amazing. You know what I mean? The change. That's you know, what I always say. Yeah. Like the carnivore diet is not just a weight loss diet. It's a weight normalization diet. You know, yeah. if you were underweight, it helps you put on muscle. If you're overweight, it regulates it and you, you shed the excess body fat. And you can yeah. lift weights. People always ask me, well, can you can you be a, an athlete and also do carnivores? Absolutely. It's just there is a small adaptation period that first three months that you start dropping a little bit in your performance. And it takes three months for your performance to go back up to where it was before you made the switch. And then eventually you're going to go beyond that. And that that actually even happens with keto. So you've already done that adaptation phase, you know. Um, yep. so and now without the plants taking room in your gut you have more room for protein high quality protein and bioavailable nutrients from animal food so i'm so excited to hear that yeah it's been interesting i mean i have i've always loved the experiment part i mean it almost doesn't matter what i'm doing but obviously i want to optimize performance of every kind and i think to be honest with you I call it uh, carnivore zen or whatever. One when I did drop the uh, um, the grains and even uh, to a slight amount. <clears throat> no, I think not even that slight. When I dropped the greens, it's almost like you can't project forward. You can't worry backwards. It really does bring you to more of a presence. And I do believe it has to do with the activation of the dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine that plants even greens have been hybridized for so many years to take the bitterness out. They're all like an extension of these one group of plants and broccoli and kale, the greens, Brussels sprouts have huge amounts of fructose in them. And I would eat two pounds of Brussels sprouts. So I was really feeding my drip of fructose, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. So like 
I'm on a, like a fructose zero diet right now. I like, love it. I, I just have to find out. I just interviewed Richard Johnson, who's like, I believe the most famous, and Dr. Lustig's pretty famous, but like, I think Richard's deeper into the understanding of fructose. He's actually working on a drug that when it blocks the fructose pathway, he can help block alcoholism. It's wild. And so the fructose zero part of it for me is an experiment in the psychoactive nature of fructose, not necessarily carnivore even, which is important, uh, but it's more, it's more on the, um, the idea that if I eliminate, well, I'll tell you a true story. So <laughs> I always hate dating myself, but I became a grandfather uh, a week from a week ago, Saturday. Okay. Oh my God. Congratulations. Yeah. And, and it's like, and I, there was, there was a lot of emotions going around. I, I wasn't there either in Chicago and, you know, we were, I was divorced and, you know, there was just a lot of emotions about them, my kid growing up and now having a baby of this, you know, that kind of thing. I was thinking, so here I am on fructose zero for about a month. And I, I had to get this like, I, I, I don't know why, but I had the, got this bag of pistachios, right? And it was just literally, I felt wonderful for a couple of hours. And I paid for that bag of pistachios for two days, mentally, emotionally, and physically, digestionally, let's put it that way. <laughs> and it's like, I just got more convert or more strength around the idea that I have healed from the 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 effects of fructose in my body mm -hmm. like there's no human bodily function required that requires fructose right yeah. and so at the end of the day like we were supposed to get fructose once or twice a year when things were ripe and those are those nasty crab apples and those little tiny wild berries and maybe a little honey if you wanted to get risk stung by a bee right, right. and so I just love, I, you know, the idea of the fructose zero experiment, like I said, is as important as the carnivore experiment, if that makes sense. I love it. Yeah, it totally makes sense. Um, another thing also is that when you're eating those plant foods, they have lectins in them. And we have very clear data. There is literal pictures under a microscope of a lectin on top of the vagus nerve traveling up the vagus nerve, which is a major highway, a nerve connecting our gut to our brain. And right. not only that, but also on top of our dopamine neurons. So what happens is that when you eat those plant foods, you get the lectins, they travel via the vagus nerve up into your dopamine producing cells, and they start destroying your ability to make dopamine. And this is why sometimes people, they will literally have full-blown depression because they are reacting to some lectin in some plant food you know yeah so so get this this will really throw you mm -hmm. so like i said i was talking to dr johnson a couple days ago on an interview and he's like he said the body he he realized they realized less than five or seven years ago that the body produces fructose and here's how it produces it high carbohydrates and salt so french fries Right. That's what I used to do. When he talks, I'm like, wow, it's like high, like, so French fries are like the perfect drug, the perfect food, if you will, to create fructose in the body. Whoa. I mean, right. I mean, it's like when you start to dig deeper into the science, you start to understand this kind of uh, deep level uh, I call it evolutionary theory, you know, and it's, it's really truly understanding the evolution, but I like to stay in my lane and try and understand the addictive nature of the food products that we eat, right? Mm. Uh, and I believe once you heal up from the ultra process, and, and that's truly what it is, healing up body and brain, then the, the, um, what people think are natural, the sugars, the fruits, the fructose start to bother you, right? The lectins start to bother you. The oxalates start to bother you because, you know, here I am a guy that hasn't had sugar, flour, or caffeine in many years, and then, you know, started to heal from that stuff. And then I've healed another, I believe, healed another level to the point where now 
Um, you know, I, I'm not supposed to be eating a lot of fructose or a lot of lectins or a lot of octolates because it's it 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 in, it it causes inflammation, body and brain. Yeah, yeah. So let me ask you about the timeline um, of what should people expect once they cut out all sugars, all grains, and <laughs> caffeine and fruit, and we should add dairy because dairy could be actually before I, before we dive into the timeline. Um, this is an important one, right? Why is it that dairy can be problematic with food addiction? Because I know a lot of carnivores love their cheese. Yeah. Well, it's the, what is it, galactose? I mean, there's still a sugar and it's not, doesn't have fructose in it, but there's still is sugar. And there's a lot of proof that even fake sweeteners of all kinds, if you, the brain gets right. sweet, it's like wired together, fired together. It starts to look for the, the high test, the real stuff, you know, and it, you get the cravings. Here's the thing that I think is the most important, one of the most important messages is who the hell wants to do any of this if you always wrestle with cravings? right? If you don't come to peace with it, like even when I was doing fruits and grains and stuff, I never had any cravings for uh, flour, sugar, or caffeine. It wasn't like I had cravings. So it didn't really bother me. I didn't really even realize it. And so, right. and so the dairy will create craving. And if it doesn't, then that's wonderful, right? Yeah. Then you can have your hard cheeses and what have you. Yeah. I just feel like if, uh, as a food addict, you're probably going to get cravings from eating dairy, right? Because it it, yeah. ha it actually activates our opioid receptors. So it's, it, it is designed to make animals get addicted to it so they would have it, you know, as their form only form of nourishment. One thing that I think that the, the cheese lovers, carnivore cheese lovers can look out for is I guess I don't really have a name for it, but I, what we could call morning hunger, right? And so what I notice is that when I have a cheese at night, that I'm my stomach is like growling. One of the things that I like try and tell people is that a growling stomach is not a real food response. It's a drug withdrawal response, right? It's not a, it's not like you're hungry. Hunger is experienced. You will find hunger is experienced differently. And when I eat cheese, I have that little rumble that I'm hungry, right? If I don't eat it, then I don't even think about food till four or five in the afternoon, you know? I can't and believe so you just said that because I was telling you before we, we started that yesterday was the only day I had dairy. And I woke up today, I was teaching at 10 o'clock in the morning. I was, I was planning on having one ribeye, one meal a day today, and I'm good. And I've yeah. been doing that, no problem. At around 10 a.m., I'm starting to teach and I could hear my stomach rumbling. And I'm like, wow, I wonder why I'm extra hungry today. I didn't make the link. You know, the growling stomach is absolutely a, a, a sugar withdrawal symptom. It's, it has nothing to do with your hunger, nothing at all. You're not hungry. You Well, I mean, you might be still, but you're, you're really, it, it's just a sugar withdrawal feeling. Um, and you know, people that really quit sugar, um, they don't believe me. I mean, I'm like everybody else. You could hear my stomach from across the table if I was back in the day, but I don't, my, my stomach doesn't growl anymore, you know, except when I know what I'm doing, you know, like from cheese or whatever. Right. So people have to really understand that that's a different signal. This is a different body signal. It has nothing to do with hunger. So Fascinating. So let's talk a little bit about the timeline because, um, you know, basically what, how long does it take for the cravings to subside? Because I think when people start to go on a carnivore diet or try to cut out the sugar, they feel so horrific in the initial stages. And so then they just, um, give up and it's like, I can't do this forever. I can't live like that every day. That's a broad question, a very broad question. You know, like a lot of people call what you're describing this keto flu, right? Um, but the keto flu is really just sugar, ultra processed carb addiction withdrawals. That's all it is. And it can last a really long time, especially heavy caffeine addicts. Okay. We have a caffeine group and there's, the, you know, if you read the research on caffeine, um, it can literally be a post-acute, it's pause, called pause, post-acute withdrawal syndrome, can last up to six or eight months of depression and 
anxiety and stuff not while you heal why it's it literally a minor amphetamine okay and amphetamine recovery is one of the longest and hardest there is so let's set that aside for a little bit um and one of the things that and i'm going to say it uh, even on your podcast because one of the things that pisses me off about the carnivore community is this caffeine crap you know some of the biggest of the big are talking about meat salt water and coffee and i'm like enough already mm. that is hurting people i believe it's not right it's yeah. like it is a powerful psychoactive that people are addicted to and it's you know destroying their their anxiety their their depression whatever so let's set that aside for a minute but if you talk about the uh the sugar and flour stuff you have to remember that you've been doing this likely since the womb, okay? A powerful psychoactive, enough to dope to uh, stimulate your dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, GABA, adrenals, uh, oxytocin, cannabinoid receptors all over your body, and you're you, you're in a flux, you're you're in a mess, and you have to let this heal. And the most important part of it is that you're you're not healing, you're healing inflammation in the body, sure. But what you're really healing is you have to go through the process, almost like getting off of uh, psychotropic meds for depression. You have been self-medicating for decades. And what's going to happen is when you stop this self-medication process, your, um, your everyday stressors, your old trauma, small T, large T, doesn't have to be sexual abuse or physical abuse. These things are going to start resurfacing, okay? These mm -hmm. things are going to start being literally, viscerally felt through your body, okay? Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's up in the air as to whether or not you have to, uh, what's been tamped down and pushed into your, you know, your psyche, your muscles, your body. The famous book, The Body Keeps the Score, is is really about this process of, of your emotions resurfacing and having to literally feel them out through your body and without help without understanding what you're going through most people turn back like because you literally feel that some most common refrain is i'm losing my mind mike I, i'm losing my mind and you're not losing your mind you're coming to your senses okay you're coming back to your senses and so you have to realize that this is depending on your habit, depending on how your early childhood trauma, your regular, you know, your, whatever, um, you are going to have some emotional work to do after you, as you let go of these things. Okay. Sometimes it's small, how you deal with your kids, your boss, your significant other, whatever is going to be different. You can't just go check out for a half an hour and have ice cream. You just, it's not going to work. You're, you're not doing it anymore, right? You're theoretically doing it for your weight or your health, but most people don't put these two things together, right? They don't put the understanding of the emotional ramifications of dropping ultra processed carbs from their diet. They just don't. And then when it hits them, they turn back. And it's not like, like, I'm going to go get a beer or I'm going to go snort a line of cocaine. It's just like, oh, it's only a soda. Oh, it's only a candy bar. And they feel that relief consciously or unconscious. Once you get far enough into the process, you know exactly what you're doing. In other words, you are actually self-medicating with the sugar, right? Yeah. But in the early days and for 99% of the population, they don't even know this is happening to them. Mm -hmm. And so they end up, um re-ingesting and they don't have the, the the a support group they don't have a guide to do it they end up just going back to their normal diet and they just think that's what what it was you know so it's hard and i have to keep pounding this drum to let people understand it because we've worked with tens of thousands of people now we have thousands of written success stories and if there's a key if there's a clue it's in their emotions, not in their food. And this is where the support group helps and joining a tribe that understands that. And I'm 
I want to make sure you mention that towards the end so that people know where to find you in order to join those support groups where you hold them twice a day, every single day. And the goal is to hit every hour, right? 24 seven, having yep. a, a support yep. group every hour of the day, which is so right. amazing. Um, so the, the timeline that you've mentioned before in previous interviews, um, the first 30 days is probably the hardest. But ideally, you want to hit 90 days. And then after your 90 days abstinent, you still want to, it, it gets better, but then there's something called the pink cloud. So can you just do that, that, that little timeline for us? Yeah, for a lot of people, it's not as bad as I'm describing. Not as far, you know, I mean, I want to, you know, hammer home the idea that this is, uh, this is real. It's not in your imagination. But for a lot of folks, after... I call it give me 90, right? Buy into Mikey's little fantasy for 90 days. And, you know, 30, 60, 90 days in, you end up uh, feeling a lot better physically right away. Okay. that This usually, this can happen at day 20, 30, 40, whatever. And we call it a pink cloud because you're feeling so good. You didn't realize you could feel so good. And then you get overconfident. Okay. You get like, oh, I can handle this now. I, I can handle a little bit of something, something. And, and addicts are broken down from my work at the Food Addiction Institute, the, the people that have been doing this for decades, um, into three categories. Um, the first category is stone cold hardcore addicts, people who biochemically cannot ingest this product without setting up cravings for more. And they have to go 100% abstinent. Okay. And then the second group is harmful users. That, that's a these numbers track with the obesity numbers. Now that said, you can be a very thin sugar addict, but they, they do track with the obesity numbers, about a third and a third and a third. And so the second group of harmful users, these are folks that maybe biochemically they could once or twice a year or you know on a schedule that they dis discern, they could have sugar, but because of the food system, they've gained a pound or two over 20 years since high school and now they're overweight and they can just get it under control, right? Um, they become aware of where, what the sugar is doing and they're not hardcore addicts. And then the last group is a group of people that are normal, they're normies, we all hate them. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> just a little bit. It, it's like the folks who can like have one cookie or half a cookie and just leave it there. And you're like, wait a minute. Like having like someone that can drink half a glass of wine and not have an alcohol problem, same type of person, right? And those folks are, they're, they're normies, right? right. And, so, and also, like I said, you can be a very thin sugar addict. This is not related to body size. We have ultra marathoners and Olympic athlete. You know, these people could do anything with their bodies, still can, but they couldn't quit sugar. And so, um, and their brain was starting to, you know, get in trouble. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, the addictive nature is very um, biodiverse and people are, everyone's a little bit different. But it's the same trajectory. You're still affecting your nucleus accumbens, your, your your brain reward system, your processing stuff. And so that's where I struggle, or that's where I try to get people to understand about their emotions and their brains, not necessarily their fat loss or their, you know, their muscles or their diet. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, since you mentioned the brain part too, so important that... We understand, like you mentioned, the nucleus accumbens, it's a part of the basal ganglia to where, you know, dopamine is produced mainly. Um, and that's like the addiction hub, if you want. And as addiction progresses, its connections to your prefrontal cortex, which is this part right be behind your forehead that deals right. with willpower, the connections actually break down. And uh, so it's not just your willpower, by the way, the prefrontal cortex is also your executive function and your ability to make a sane decision. So you think you're making a sane decision, but you're really not because you no longer have those connections um, that are strong and solid. And so the kind of the addiction takes over and it takes time for, for these to heal and for the connections to go back and, and repair themselves. Oh, I couldn't agree more. That is 110% right. I have gotten stronger over the years. And I, if somebody calls me for coaching, I tell them, you are, they describe their habit or their weight or whatever. And I say to them, you are literally not in a mental state to make a sound decision about the future of your health. 
And, you know, some people listen, some people don't, but that's, I believe a true statement that they literally are not in that position because they're, they're, I mean, they're calling diabetes or, you know, Alzheimer's diabetes three. Right. And so I, I, the, the, the science and Chris Palmer and all these other guys, the science around the brain and sugar has been exploding in the last three years, even less, but, and people just don't understand that that's the important part. You know, that's the leading the ship, right? The, the brain's leading the, the, the ship on your body or whatever. So, yeah, I, I just, you, you can't, you couldn't be more right. And, and people miss that part. They're so worried. Everybody that comes to me wants to lose weight, 95% of them, right? They think that's the issue. And it, it is a lot, but we got a saying, you know, come for the vanity, stay for the sanity, right? Because you start to get calmer. You start to remember better. You, we do surveys all the time, right? And we thought that weight loss would be number one as the best benefit, but it's really the brain. It's like processing better, remembering better, focusing more longer. Um, and that's the, and that's a great benefit and, and less anxiety, you know? Love it. Yeah. You had, you said something once on a podcast and I'm trying to recreate it, but I want, I want to see if you can recreate it. You said uh, once focusing on the weight loss um, well, like, like you lose the abstinence if you focus on the weight loss, but if you focus on abstinence, you get the weight loss. I don't know. Am I saying Got that? it right? Focus on uh, weight loss, you'll lose your abstinence. Focus, focus on abstinence, you'll lose the weight. Love it. Just wanted okay. it in my interview. <laughs> wanted it there. Yeah. <laughs> Sugar, like the, or, you know, and here's the difficult part, okay? It's like people think, for some reason that 100% abstinence from sugar is a impossible and not realistic. Right. But when you really have experimented with the back and forth and tried and tried and tried, everybody comes back with the same conclusion that 100% abstinence is a hundred times easier than like just a little. Right. Wow. And look, this is not, I don't, I don't want to sound fanatical or anything. You do not have to, main question, do I have to do this for the rest of my life? Like, is that something, you know what I mean? They can't envision a never having a wedding or a birthday party or whatever, no sugar. And I say, you know, maybe, but you only have to do it one day at a time for now. I call it a scratch test, right? Scratch test is simple. Like if you went to the doctor for dust or pollen or ragweed or some kind of allergy, they give you that little scratch test on your arm, put a bandaid over to see that it you know, inflames. Our scratch test is zero ultra processed carbs for 30, 60 or 90 days. You reset your body. If I get 90 days out of somebody, almost with 100% um, uh, success rate, they do not go back. Their skin is better. They're losing weight. Their brain is better. The anxiety is less. It's an, it's a, I try and get people, I call them tweakers, not like the amphetamine tweakers, but like somebody just wants to tweak their body a little bit. They've look, they've already done a hundred diets, literally 7.9 different diets are the, is the average of our folks when we do a survey, right? So you've done eight diets and you've tried, you've read stuff, you've bought stuff and crap and just try 90 days with no ultra processed carbs and see what happens. But I want to warn you, what we've been talking about the whole podcast is that there will be emotional ramifications. There will be something that changes in that. And without a guy, without somebody who's traveled that road before, you're going to feel like you're losing your mind. You're going to feel worried, fearful, anxiety. You're going to, you might even, a lot of people are just crying for no good reason. Like, right? They're just sad. They don't. And when they put it all together, you know, genius really is only pattern recognition, right? And we've seen this pattern over and over and over and over. Like we see it so many times that, you know, we now can, you know, walk and guide you through it. So I, I just want to, I want folks to get away from the weight loss thought. I, I want them to, you know, yeah, they're going to get healthy. I want them to get to the 
I'm sure you everyone's learned, heard about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? This is where you ascend to, you know, you get your needs met. People want to self-actualize, right? They do. They want to be the best person. I always say I want to die with my music in me, meaning I don't want my creativity to be going to the grave with me. And what people find is they they end up um the, the goals that they wanted to reach, the dreams that they had, if they're people who are achievers or want to do something with their life, I always, be, and I still believe this, and I think it's not recognized enough, is that sugar is an amotivational drug like marijuana, right? It affects the cannabinoid receptors. It affects so much of your brain that you can't go to the gym because you can't get up off the couch. You've learned to hack uh, 10 million, 7 million years of evolution to chase food and sex to procreate the species by sitting on the couch eating Oreos. You can get the same feeling, the same dopamine, serotonin. you can set, get the same rush, right? The same feeling and you don't have to move. That's powerful. The body's powerful. We all know that. So anyway, I get it off on a soapbox. I didn't mean to, but you, no, you understand what I'm saying. You know, folks are Folks are not, they're, they're, they're not seeing the forest for the trees, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And um, they're in denial too, in a way, uh, because how can somebody like me, for example, do my dissertation on addiction, <laughs> do a <laughs> drug, a, a very drug, no, not, not there yet. No. <laughs> do, do a free diet under the sun and, you know, just the sheer amount of work that I put into trying to always stay fit and lose weight. And it's like, I am just trying to like delay having to do what is necessary, which is cut that attachment right. to, to sugar and food in general, you know? Right. Well, denial is a symptom of addiction. One, I'm not really, you know, cravings and denial. I'm I'll be perfectly honest. I'm not to the either scientific or even internal understanding of how they work, why they work or why it is so, but you know, you've all seen the alcoholic who's, uh, you know, obviously his life's a mess or the drug addict. And they're like, oh, no, I'm just, I'm fine. I'm, I'm good. It's just a little, I just, I drink a little much on the weekend, whatever. Right. And the same food addicts and alcohol, you know, they're like, well, you know, I'm not as heavy as Sally or, you know, whatever. They, they compare each other and they, and again, I don't, it's really a protective and ego protection to keep your dopamine drip alive, I guess the best way to put it. I, I, it's the only thing I can come up with. But genuinely, cravings or a need to re-ingest and denial are symptoms of the disease of addiction. And sometimes I call it pattern interruption, like Tony Robbins, you know, you got to break the pattern, like hit them upside the head, you know, figuratively and say, Look at this realistically. And some people don't want to listen or they're not ready. People ask me, what's my business model? I say, I sort for people who are ready. Okay. If they're not ready, it doesn't, all my help, all, nothing is going to help them. Right. They've got a, in the traditional world of alcohol and drugs or addiction recovery, they call it a bottom. I'm not a fan of bottoms. Right. You don't need to have type two diabetes and be a hundred pounds overweight to change. You can make the decision and change today if you want. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting puzzle. And I like puzzles. So yeah. I like puzzles. So we keep after it a little bit. So we keep going. And you work with a lot of, um, people one-on-one -on -one. it's it's a little bit more of an exclusive coaching program not that it's exclusive but it's you know it requires a a, a decent it's a investment. little more money yeah it, it's a we have now uh 12 or 13 coaches and i don't do any more i do a, a few people but it's pretty pro prohibitive for most people um but the coaches that i have that are trained definitely work one-on-one -on -one with folks and it's a good some people need that. They want that. You know, they're used to paying trainers or therapists. Here's one of the things about therapists that I found interesting. Is, and we have therapists who are actually our coaches. Um, they're, people go to their talk therapy about their weight loss and food issues and whatever for decades. And 
they unwind it all at the 7-Eleven after the session, right? Mm -hmm. And so I've come to say like um, therapy, talk therapy plus sugar equals zero net gain. You're not getting anywhere, right? We've had so many people with so many years of therapy come in, get off sugar, and you know, they, some of them go back to therapy to work through some of the issues, but really it wasn't the therapy that was helping them. It never helped them get off the sugar. It was getting off the sugar, help them move forward in their life. Right. It's like a, what came first, the chicken or the egg thing. And so, yeah, it's, again, it's only seeing the over and over and over and over with people attempting this again, people come thinking they want to lose weight, but then they get all of these other personal growth benefits. Yeah, yeah, because now you actually have to do the emotional work that you put off for years and years right. when you, you could just numb down your feelings with, with drugs, really. And the yeah. more I look into the research, the more I'm convinced sugar is not only a hard drug, it is a harder drug than the hard drugs. Because if you look at just the rat studies, I remember when I was working on my dissertation, I had to uh, really dive deep into that. And so I would, I would be citing all of the rat studies that showed that sugar, that ro uh, rodents preferred sweetened water or sh whether artificially or regularly sweetened water, they preferred it much more than cocaine, even at high doses of cocaine. Well, now yep. recently, um, I remember looking at the 2017 studies, there are more studies coming up showing how the same thing is true with heroin. Rats prefer saccharin, yep. that sweet taste, <laughs> by a large margin over heroin. And that's just pure sugar. We're not only eating pure sugar, we're, we're eating things that are more addictive than pure white sugar. It's a combination of high fat, high sugar. And sometimes we'll add the chocolate. And we know chocolate can be psychoactive for reasons that we still don't fully comprehend. And so now you have this bomb foods everywhere and we're only thinking oh yeah sugar is, is yeah did you hear about sugar being more addictive than cocaine and heroin right. it's like no it's more addictive than both you know because we're we're not eating pure white sugar we're eating yeah. worse foods so oh i couldn't agree more i mean it's absolutely the gateway drug it's absolutely this is an unconscious uh process that people end up walking through uh, I literally just got off the interview with Nicole Lavina and she's like, it, it said it succinctly, you know, she's neuroscientist, Princeton, the whole nine. And she's like, you, you're using the sugar to, you know, comfort yourself, self-medicate, then it stops working. Maybe you have a little nicotine or some caffeine or whatever. And you get to be 13 or 14, you're like finding the beer, finding the pot, you know? You're continuing to, in, in, the, in the case of sugar, it's unconscious that you are comforting yourself emotionally. It's mm -hmm. literally because it's ubiquitous and free, even a child can score it. Yes, a definitively druggy term, but they can score sugars like just regularly during the day. They don't, no one, literally no one, parents included, think about that they are self-medicating the divorce they're self-medicating the you know what's going on in school they're whatever but when you get to the alcohol or the pot at 13 or 14 or 15 or whatever you start to realize that you are doing it actually some people don't they just think it's a big party right they don't understand i mean i did back then yeah. so yeah i mean it's definitely the gateway drug to emotional to soothe emotional pain, right? right. And this is, the, this is the untold story of this epidemic, of this obesity crisis. This is the untold piece of the puzzle that no one... And look, I always use this uh, kind of an, a, an amalgam of all of my recovery stories. A 200-pound 200 200 woman or a 300 pound woman who falls to a right size body for her, whatever that is, um, whatever nature or God, whatever your belief system believed that she was supposed to have, you know, whatever it is, 120 to 150, some, you know, she falls to a body that she's happy with that functions well because she went abstinent flour and sugar. 
She does not talk about the food. She does not talk about the diet. She does not talk about the exercise. She talks, when she talks about her story, the emotional recovery she had to go through. This is 90% of us, 90% of the people who've had success, right? Mm -hmm. And so this avatar, they call it in the internet world, this, this combination of all of the folks who have success talk about their emotional recovery, not their food recovery or their exercise recovery. It's, and that is a clue that maybe people are looking in the wrong place. 78 billion dollars a year founded a new statistic the 78 billion dollar a year diet industry is enough to feed the entire underserved world every year so it's just ridiculous that and most of a lot of it's spent in the united states to try and do pills and books and courses and this that and exercise that to lose weight when in reality, it all centers around their emotional development right. and the ultra processed carbs they're eating, right? Mm. It's kind of crazy, really. And, and who, who are know. the, what are the traits or, or what are the, the things that you see come up with the ones who succeed? You know, you know they want to be better. You don't have a lot of time, right? You, you're, you only have, I think, what, two more minutes? I don't know, whatever else she can, we, we can, she's on my team. Well, she, she understands. Okay. Uh, um, so the answer to your question, ask the question again, I'm sorry. Yeah. Like what, what, what are the, what are the things that people who are successful are doing differently than the ones who keep relapsing? Um, it comes back to that denial thing. It comes back to the or look, also, I, I'm very empathetic because it comes back to how hard what they have to process is. If it's major sexual abuse or physical abuse or something, um, if it's a tough life situation, 80 plus percent of our folks, their spouse is not on board. They're not. Wow. Matter of fact, a lot of times it's working against them. Like they, they don't want to give up their whatever, their sugar, their, you know, so it's a very difficult process, you know, for those folks. And without the group, without some people that can confirm that what they're doing is the right thing, they fall back into this group of people. I mean, you've heard the phrase, you, you become the average of the five people you hang around with the most. This is actually now a proven statistic with weight, weight, weight wise right? You become the average weight of the five people you have. Yeah, it's so true. It's so true. And so, you know, it, I, I think the, the failure comes with, and this is kind of trite. People say this a lot is the, you know, the journey is inward. They, you know, people think it's a trite statement, but this inability to accept reality as it is and, and to try and bend it to your desires. And when you're not successful to comfort yourself with, uh, an anxiety reliever that's perfectly legal and available at any corner. And actively so that's, pushed on you. Yeah. Yeah. And actively pushed on you. Exactly. And so that's like, how does it's, it's a hard escape. It's like getting out Alcatraz, you know, it's a really hard way in this society to be that different. And we haven't talked about this much, but the social aspect of it is hard. We're tribe animals. We like to do things together. Right. And when you begin this process of quitting, you end up as the odd person out, the odd man out. You're, 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 you're different and you have to explain what you're eating and you have to explain why you have to say no a lot. And people, that's hard. At the core of all this, I mean, we could do a Tim Ferriss podcast for two hours. You know, it's codependency, okay? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people believe codependency is the relationship you have with others. But in reality, it's the relationship you have with yourself first. And when you can't say no, when it's hard, I'll tell you a lot of the people that fail are people pleasers, right? They, they, they've grown up pleasing others. I mean, it's no secret that myself and all my contemporaries, everyone is a woman pretty much. I mean, all of the people who seek help are women mm -hmm. because they, they're used to, 
pleasing their self last and pleasing everyone else first, their so children, true. their spouse, their parents. And so, you know, it, it doesn't, it takes the arc of a podcast of this length to get this entire story out, the entire yeah. part of it out, because anything short, I actually say on the 30th day of my challenge, my videos, they get a video every day kind of thing. I tricked you. I tricked you into like recovery. I tricked you into change. You thought it was about food. You thought it was about diet. You thought it was about exercise. You thought it was about whatever. And now they understand and that they have to work with others to get themselves uh, to the to the year. And if they got a lot more weight to lose or whatever. So, yeah, it's uh, it's like I said, it's a big puzzle. I love the puzzle. And uh, you're very kind to listen to the entire story. A lot of times I, I, I'm on podcasts with keto influencers and they're only talking about the macros and the ba ba da ba da ba da and the health and the, you know, once, it, and they don't delve into this part that you're, you know, listening very intently. And I, I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I have, you know, really uh, just focused my efforts recently because I find while coaching clients, they come to me for weight loss on carnivore. And some of them want to keep a little bit of um, artificially sweetened products here and there just a little bit. And now I just know with with 100% accuracy, who's going to succeed and achieving their weight loss goals and who won't will not. Because right. the ones who will keep some and I'm I was more flexible in the beginning, like, yeah, okay, we can do it. Um, eventually drop out anyway after three around three weeks that's usually the cutoff point sometimes they'll uh sold it is right people. right it's so yeah. true your experience is showing that's exactly right yeah and so now i'm like listen you have to you can't take this casually and i pull up all the studies on sugar being more addictive than heroin everything you know like this is you can't play around with that you can't have a little bit of heroin and then expect <laughs> to be clean the rest of the week and not have cravings and suffer yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, it's wild, really. It's 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 hard because people don't want to give it up and they're they're in denial a lot about That's that. That's the thing. And, it's and they don't want to be different. In denial, huh? They don't want to be different. And I get that. They don't want to be different. What's exciting about the groups that we're, we have is that they they're not different in that group. You know, they're not different. They're they're this is what everybody's doing. Right. And the you know, so the so and look, I mean, I'm really a big fan of mirror neurons and memetics and stuff where most of society is about, you know, it's like a thousand years ago, you left the tribe, you didn't conform to the people around you, you died. And so this draw to be like the people around you is strong, very strong, very innate. And so if you're with a group of people who are wanting to um, move in the direction of abstinence from sugar and weight loss and brain clarity and all the good stuff, then you do that. You end up being wanting to be like that, right? Yeah. So that yeah, helps. So, so that you don't let your guard down eventually. And, and then if you don't constantly get um, surrounded by a tribe who, who really is going through it or trying to get clean and sober, um, it's very easy to kind of downplay the severity. We forget how intense the cravings are. We forget the gravity of the situation before sometimes. And we get, like you said, overconfident. And so I agree with you. And you've mentioned that in your previous podcast, how it's so important to maintain that at least once a week, a meeting like the ones that you offer. So since yeah. we're, I know, I, I, I just feel so bad. I don't want to keep you. So why don't you tell everybody how they can uh, find you and how can they join those group meetings and all the good stuff? No, thank you. I appreciate it. It's sugaraddiction.com. Um, it's, you know, the oldest website on the internet about sugar addiction, really. Um, and you can go there and it just says up in the right hand corner, join the challenge or whatever. Um, you can join 30 day challenge, 30 days. I come into your inbox every day uh, and give you a video to walk through the, and so the, the hardest part, one of the hardest parts is that first 30 days of withdrawals and, you know, changes in your emotions and stuff. And so I walk you through it. 
And there's a little tick box if you want to join what's called detox to lifestyle, which is getting you from day 31 to 365. And there's more meetings. It's a different flavor of meetings. Don't talk so much about the food. Um, and so you can do that too, but you know, you don't need to do that, but, um, and you can, if you, you know, don't, it's less than a hundred dollars if you want to do it, but it's, you can grab the book that's there free too, if you want to do that and just read the book first. Um, the Amazon book, we brought it back to the website, give it away for free now. So if you want to check that out, you can do that too. Fantastic. And I'll make sure that I link all of your websites and uh, direct ways to contact you and also your Instagram in the description box below. You should have way more Instagram followers. I think we should do an Instagram. I, I, I got a sad Instagram story. I think one of my uh, outsourcers put something and they, they whacked our Instagram. We did have a lot bigger one. Really? Uh, yeah. Something. I can't remember what it was. Well, actually, they wouldn't tell us what it was. Oh, they just we, took it down. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's yeah, start oh, over. That's the problem with Instagram and YouTube too now. Like the censorship is out of control and we're all, especially being in the health field, we're all very, very uh upset about it. And you know, um, this is why now you're having other social media giant not giants just yet, but you know, they're popping up so that there is no censorship there. And you know, YouTube sends a survey every once in a while to check uh and see our satisfaction and they're always asking where else do you think you're gonna start creating content and i i'm always telling them hey i want to go to all these other sites <laughs> be careful yeah like you know come on we are the experts you can't censor an expert by some other group who yeah like no will, they know better i will give you a little warning i did get censored i didn't get whacked but on, on facebook i got censored for the uh uh cocaine is or sugar is eight times more um uh, powerful than cocaine. They, they said this is, I know, but they, I know, but that I'm just telling you, they, they really did. They whacked yeah. me. Yeah. It's a censorship nowadays and misinformation simply means follow the money. That's, that's it. That's, it's right. very clear to me now. But I mean, anyway, Mark Iman even talks about that eight hey, times. Hey, hey, I know tomorrow, by the way, I'm doing an IG live with Nicola Vina. I mean, she, I think she's the one who did uh, some of those studies too. So, you know, yeah, she is. She started way back with Bart Hobel at Princeton. Yeah. Ashley yeah. Gerhardt, all them. So Yeah, that's right. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time, Mike, spending it and sharing your wisdom with us. So thank you so much. It's been wonderful. No, you really, like I said, you are uh, a step above uh, the uh, the average carnivore influencer. So. Thank you. Yeah, I, I yeah, I feel like that's where most of the carnivores are going to follow suit because they're understanding now carnivore. We got excited about it and everything. But you know what? We're still addicted. <laughs> we, we can't have honey. <laughs> right. The people, I mean, again, I, we could do a Tim Ferriss, but I, the people that are the carnivores that are doing the fruit and honey deal. I don't know about that, man. That's not going to end well, I don't think. Exactly. It's just that they haven't dealt with addiction. They don't understand it. And so right. that's why they don't. They can't let it go. It. They can't let their fructose go. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. They truly are medicating. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. We're anyway. Very, thank you so much. I really, I really, really enjoyed this. It was fun. and, and I'm so glad to hear that. You should be commended for. We'll do a we'll do a round two soon enough. I'll I'll hit you up soon and we'll do another one. All right, sounds great. Awesome. Let me ask you a question. Do you have children? I don't. Oh. Yeah. Well, we're doing what? a kid summit now, but you need to be on our next quit sugar summit. So, oh, absolutely. Yeah. I would love to. Let's do it then. Absolutely. Yay. Right. This All made right. my day. Thank All you, right. Mike. Thank you everybody you you. for being with us. Uh, make sure you hit like subscribe and hit that little notification button so youtube alerts you every time i post a new video thank you for sticking with us and i'll see you in the next one take care bye bye bye